it's Jessica Honiger, founder of the socially conscious fashion brand Noonday Collection. And this is the Going Scared podcast, where we cover all things social impact, entrepreneurship, and courage. I have been dying to get today's guest on our show. You guys have got to know Lovey Ajay. Y'all, she is absolutely laugh out loud, hilarious, hilarious. She wrote her debut book, I'm Judging You, The Do Better Manual, a couple years ago, which made the New York Times bestseller list. And it's a collection of essays that critiques our fame-based social media-centric lives while encouraging us to do better. She's the writer of the popular blog, Awesomely Lovey, where she covers all the things. I mean, we're talking from pop culture to beauty, TV, movies, race, social injustice, all of life's random adventures. She just launched a podcast called Rants and Randomness. And our conversation today covers, well, very lovey style. Everything from friendship to social media to what are the best beauty serums she's using these days. Give it a listen. Jen Hatmaker is definitely your biggest fan on planet Earth. She is absolutely obsessed with you for good reason. I love her. She is the best. She really is the best. She lives here in Austin, and she is definitely one of the most hilarious people of my real life friends, and she's attracted to hilarious, smart people. And so she introduced me to your work, but then I met you at the Texas Women's Conference. Yep. Yep. You were hanging with Tiffany Aliche, who I've since had on this podcast, and you had... I wanted to be a part of your crew. You guys were just hanging out, having fun, talking about like how you'd been up all night, chatting. <laughs> so I'm just, I was just like, this is, the, I want these people in my life. So I just wanted to hear a little bit more about your sisterhood because I feel like as much as we talk about sisterhood these days and I feel like sisterhood has made this comeback, I don't feel like enough people actually have it in real life. So tell us a little bit more about about your your friends. Oh my goodness. Um I think sisterhood is really important and just friendship is really important because our friends have really like a direct impact on our lives in in the strongest ways, even more than sometimes our family because they're basically our chosen family. And I have um a strong group of friends who Tiffany's a part of um and we call ourselves the West African Voltron. And oh my gosh, it's a lot of us who met in random ways who realized what we had in common was we're first generation African, African Americans. Ultimately, we are we were born. Most of us were born in either Ghana or Nigeria. And we realized that this thread that brings us together allows us to kind of shorthand our lives. We understand how we grew up because our families act the same, our parents act the same, have the same values. But what we all really have in common is that we uphold excellence. Um, Uh. So we cheer each other on, we support each other. We're the friends who aren't just cheering you on even when you are doing terrible things. No, we will challenge you. We will say, you know what, I can help you. We will say, I'm here for you. So yeah, we we exchange information. We... um, and because we're all in very similar places in our careers, even though we're in different industries, we're also able to support each other through the things that, you know, people might not typically have, such as like when one of us needs to get a new job, we would definitely be like, hey, I can help you figure out how to negotiate. We're just um, a group of people who insist on friendship being a verb. Who was your first best friend in your life? Oh, my goodness. My first best friend was Tommy Vaughn. Um, I was born in Nigeria and um, I went to a private school since I was probably two. I started school at two um, and we were in the same class. That is that the Nigerian way? I mean, that's early. Yeah. Yeah. I started school at two. I was reading by three. <laughs> um, <Whoa. clears throat> so yeah, Tommy was my first ever best friend. Like there's a picture of us where we're both two years old, wearing our uniform, sitting next to each other. And up until I left Nigeria when I was nine, we were inseparable. Like every class picture, we were next to each other from two to nine. Wow. Yeah. So what was that like, leaving that friendship and moving to America? How did your friendships transition? Oh, man, it was tough because ultimately moving to a new continent changes the game for you. I remember um, when we moved here, 
the first, uh, one of the first things I did was write her a letter <laughs> just to say hi. And I think I sent her a dollar. <laughs> that's awesome I think I sent her a dollar and you know just, she still has that dollar you know I was just like oh my goodness so I that's how I I stayed in touch with her but then we lost touch after a few years um I went back to Nigeria for the first time I think 2011 and okay. I we found each other on Facebook I think in 19 no no in 2000 and uh 2007 or 2008 we find each other on Facebook because she hit me up and said, you look like my first best friend who <gasps> went to this school. And I was like, it's me. <laughs> it was really cool. It wow. was really cool to, to meet up on, on Facebook. So when I was going back to Nigeria, I actually messaged her and be like, hey, I'm coming for two or a week or two. And she was like, oh my gosh, I have to see you. And sure enough, she came to my hotel and uh, we've kept in touch since. What do you think are the obstacles that prevent women from forming that sisterhood and like making friendship a verb? I think it's from us carrying some past experiences and projecting it onto everybody else. Um, mm. So a lot of times, you know, some people will be like, oh, I can't be friends with women. You know, I've been burned. So people mm. put up walls, some that are earned um, to protect themselves, to protect their spirits, to protect their hearts. But the thing about that is in your attempt to keep the bad out, you also tend to keep the good out. Um, mm. It means that wall that you put up, yes, it might keep you from being close to the person who might betray you, but it might keep you from also cultivating some of the best relationships of your life. Um, mm. So I, I understand people's need to be careful and, and hesitance to be vulnerable, but I really do think at the end of that is some of the best relationships. Mm. Um, and for me, I've just, you know, I've had friendship experiences that haven't been great where we are no longer friends or we fell out, but I never want one experience to keep me from experiencing beautiful things, you know? Yeah. Like I never want that one fallout to be the reason why I didn't cultivate this one friendship right. that could be life-changing ultimately. So Glennon Doyle, she talks about this idea of forming a horseshoe of friends instead yeah. of a circle of friends. So how do you do that when you've got this crew of 16 and obviously to be a part of it, you need to be from West Africa. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, if you meet some other super cool Nigerian, like, how would you create a horseshoe there? Is that something you think about? So here's the thing is, so the Voltron is not my only group of friends. They're just my more public group of friends. Um, okay. In terms of the horseshoe that uh, Glennon talks about, which I've, I love Glennon also. Um, yes. And understanding that, again, like the heart is, is limitless in this ability to build relationships and, and love mm. and, and connect with people. So, you know, I have other friends, but I think the horseshoe is more about not locking yourself out of, you know, the idea that you might cultivate new relationships. So the horseshoe mm. is insisting that you're not saying no new friends, right? Like at any right. moment you might meet somebody and connect and be like, yo, I feel like we've been friends all our lives. And though we just met three weeks ago, it's kind of leaving that open heart. Um, mm. And her idea of the horseshoes also, the circle is closed off, right? The circle right, is like, right. hey, there's no other room for anybody else. But the horseshoe is like, hey, here's a door that you can come in. So I think it's there's something there because it kind of leaves you open to to receiving yeah. the things that you should receive. I mean, that's really how I met Tiffany because we were in this moment of sitting beside each other. No one was in our line to sign our books. And so <laughs> it was like, let's... Let's get to know each other. And then we've, you know, we've gotten to be friends. And it's, yeah, you never know when those opportunities are going to present themselves. So it's like you almost always have to have this horseshoe heart to stay open to those opportunities. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that your horseshoe doesn't have a filter. You can still have your filter up. Oh, well, up. that's right. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you can still have your filter <laughs> up. You know, you can still have a discerning eye and understand, um, What's worth coming in the door? What can you let into the door? Mm. Who can you let in the door? What type of values do you need to have in the horseshoe? 
But I, I think it, it just focuses more on the openness of the right. possibilities. So at the conference, you talked about being a truth teller. And then you said that among your group of friends, you guys are about excellence, calling each other up, calling each other out and forth. What does me being a truth teller mean to you? Um, I think being a truth teller is just being honest in all ways, in in all rooms that you're in. Um, oftentimes, we we find ourselves only honest to certain people or in certain rooms. But what happens when we actually commit to being honest, thoughtfully honest, that is, in all rooms that we're in, to all people that we encounter, how does that shift the world when we insist that we will lie less? (laughs) Um, So I'm just a bad liar. If I'm lying, you can tell on my face because I don't really mask it well. I don't have a poker face either. So I pretty much learned early on me lying is not going to take me far because people will know I'm lying. (laughs) So (laughs) I'm just like, you know, it might just be best for me to kind of just be honest. And I've been this person since I was younger. So it was one of those things where when I started blogging um, 16 years ago, my blog started standing out and people were like, oh my God, you keep it real. You say what I'm thinking, but I I didn't dare to say it. And I didn't find it extraordinary. I was just like, I'm just telling the truth. And people find it extraordinary. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> because I was like, this is just it's regular fascinating stuff. that I can s- tell someone I'm judging you. And everyone's like, you said it out loud. Yes. You know, I think it's like, but, you know, telling thoughtful truths is different from the person who keeps it real until it goes wrong. Right. There's a, there's people yeah. who are like, oh, they'll, they'll, they'll say hateful things under the umbrella of keeping it real. That's not Mm, it. You know, mm. that's not it. It's not to be completely a douchebag or to be the person who is just like using slurs and being like, well, I'm just being honest. That's not really it. But being a truth teller is more about like being the person who is able to um, speak honestly about how they're feeling, about the things that they're seeing around them, about um, just how the world is. And that's what I I do. Mm. Well, and you do it through humor, which you are absolutely one of the most hilarious people on planet Earth today. <laughs> I mean, there are just few people that can speak the truth <laughs> and make you laugh out loud the way Lovey can do <laughs> for all of us. When did you sort of learn how to speak the truth in humor? Like, does, do your parents have stories when, oh, yeah, when Levy was six years old, like, listen to this story. Are there any of those? Yeah, I mean, I think um, my humor is very much also based on my Nigerianness because Nigerians are very straightforward people. And our parents also don't necessarily do that much work to spare our feelings <laughs> this when we're little. And yes. so you you basically form this like armor around yourself of like humor can be used in so many different ways. And I think, I don't think I realized I was funny though until probably um, high school. I ended up just hanging, like my, my crew in high school was just a group of just goofy people. And we'd spend lunch just making fun of each other and cracking each other up for no reason. So um, we were just really kind of lighthearted and, and, and really joyful in how we approach life. Like we'll see each other in the hallway <laughs> and like yell at each other across the hallway, something really funny about what the person has on for no reason. And we'd all cackle. But I realized early on that humor is the great equalizer. If you can make somebody laugh, you pull their defenses down and they're more willing to hear what you have to say, uh, right? Like it, yeah. it becomes the wall that they might've th- thought they put up in front of you, that wall crumbled without them even realizing it because you just made them laugh. So Mm. it's a powerful tool. And I don't approach my work like I'm going to be funny. I never, when I started writing and I started blogging, I wasn't approaching it like, okay, I'm going to have a humor blog. I literally was just saying what I was thinking in the way that I was thinking it. And people were like, yo, this is funny. And I'm like, that's interesting. Okay. It's never conscious because I feel like if I try to be funny, I probably won't be. I don't know. I've never really tried to be funny. I think I just, a lot of comedies couch into pointing out the absurdities of the world. 
And Mm -hmm. ultimately that's what I do. Um, Yeah. Is point out like, yo, this thing is weird. Have you noticed that? And people are like, you're right. Oh my gosh. That's (laughs) That's ultimately what humor is. Uh, and it just works in my favor because the world is really absurd and there's a lot <laughs> so, of ridiculous yeah. things to point out. So I am never without uh, material. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, it's funny that you say it comes from being Nigerian because I, I've never been to West Africa, but I go to East Africa frequently and I have a son from East Africa and I always have to prepare myself like, okay. They're going to shoot real straight. They're going to talk about, oh, Greg, you have gotten so fat. I oh, mean, girl. you are looking good. I mean, I have to literally like <laughs> prepare, like desensitize my Americanness <laughs> and just get Facts. ready. Facts. Facts only. Oh, my gosh. Facts it kills only. me. It Facts only. Facts oh, my only. gosh. Oh, the, my gosh. Like, jazz, especially, I've been to East Africa too, but like West Africans, yo, if you, th- that's why a lot of, us are very um, somewhat unflappable in, in high stress situations because our whole life has been high stress situations presented by people who just shoot straight to the hip for us. So yeah, like a lot of times, so their favorite insult is like calling you a goat. <laughs> like, okay. So when you do something <laughs> foolish that your parents don't like, they, they will call you a foolish goat. So if your parents are calling you a foolish goat, what do you care what yeah. anybody else is calling you? What do you care? What do you, why do you care? You're like, okay, so. For real. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. So like, do you just laugh with this whole helicopter parenting, sort of over parenting that a lot of us do here in America yes. and how we're like every of our children's is a special snowflake? Yes, absolutely. It's really funny because we never got, so we never got participation uh, trophies, like the idea that like you just showing up oh my god i'm so proud of you because you went no no (laughs) did you come in first no then then why why did you not come in first oh you didn't okay well do better next time there wasn't a oh my god i'm gonna just give you a high five because you tried no like your parents will get mad at you if you showed up with the b they'll be like so what happened to the a why did you not get that A? Or you even get the A minus. Why did you not get the actual A? So yeah, we we didn't get yeah. the um, just showing up is good enough. We got the, I need you to show up and I need you to be number one. Be excellent. Be excellent. Oh my gosh, yeah. Tiffany was telling me about her family, how her dad, they put the, the electrical bill out just on the dining table and they all had to know like how much they overspent the next month. And I mean- Honestly, her that conversation and how she does money, I was like, oh, I want to, can I ship my kids off to live with your parents? Can they start a new business where my, my kids just go? Well, you know, it's the idea of being trusted with yourself in a, in a cert- separate way. Them trusting you that you will hold yourself accountable without necessarily them yeah. having to do, even though they will still do it, they will still hold you accountable to your failures or to your lack of excellence. However, They want you to feel in the moment that you're taking this test, not when you get the result back. When you're taking the test, you feel the pressure to show up and be really good. It's not like, oh Mm -hmm. my God, I'm going to get the results back and then finally freak out. No. While you're sitting there, you're like, okay, I know I already studied. I know I spent my time on this. I know I've done my work. So I'm going to show up in this way. So they won't have anything to say to me. (laughs) Like that's, that's ultimately that it's it's also trusting you that you have a higher standard for yourself than I have for you. And it's also yeah. kind of trusting you to be in a, like a mini adult. Like they essentially raised us like mini adults. Um, right. You weren't having a babysitter when you were 10. You're staying at home by yourself. <laughs> like yeah. you, I, I, I raised you to be able to take care of yourself. So I'm going to trust you that you'll be okay for the next couple of hours. I'll be back at this time. Here's food. You're good. That's right. If there's even food, I mean, that's food. nice. <laughs> like, don't burn down the house. In fact, I already know you won't burn down the house because you have more sense than this. All right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's how a lot of us were, were raised and how our parents approached us. Well, it seems to have worked. I'm saying. Because. I'm saying. I'm telling you. Gosh. Yeah. Oh, well, 
I might be uh, calling all my Nigerian friends for parenting tips from for here on out. <laughs> okay, so speaking of absurdities, right? So helicopter parenting. Then there was the whole recent, you know, these Hollywood stars that bribed oh these gosh. schools. To, that, what are some absurdities that have you laughing these days? The Hollywood parents that bribed the college, that is so far from what my parents would have done that it's laugh it's it's like laughable in five different ways because <laughs> not only are you going to get into the Ivy League college I need you to get into all of them <laughs> like <and laughs> yes. don't even look at me to spend any money on any of it because clearly you're going to score this high score on your ACTs and SATs it's so laughable we were never we didn't even know it was an option to be cheated in sc- into school <laughs> like like what? I don't I'm, know if I did either, Levy, until a couple of weeks ago. Listen, I was like, oh my God, you want to talk about privilege? That is some privilege. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the stories I hear, it's essentially setting your kids up for failure. It's nothing but setting your kids up for failure to cheat them through life because there's going to be a point, and everybody gets to that point where there's no money that can help you in that situation. But when you've been ushered along and helicoptered parents along for so long, you won't, you don't have the actual skills to then burst that wall yourself. Like it's, it, it's going to catch up with you at one point or the other. So my whole thing is I want to raise and have little humans who can navigate this world without me constantly parenting them. I want to mm-hmm, have, mm-hmm. I think there needs to be people in this. I hear about, um, from college professors now, how parents are officially the worst, like a kid getting a grade they don't like in an exam and the parent calling the college professor. How is this kid supposed to operate when they go into the real world and they're on a job and they face any type of conflict? Is is mom going to come back down and visit your boss? It it, it is very absurd to me. We are basically giving people, um, we're 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 ensuring that we're going to raise a generation of helpless and hopeless people who have no um, resilience because they've, they've mm-hmm. never had to figure out their own problems. Hey, I just wanted to take a second to thank you so much for tuning in. I just really appreciate this podcast community. And on that note, I want to get to know you. It's really a hard channel to get to know people. And I want to know what has really resonated with you, what you like, what you don't like. And I'm offering you a $100 gift certificate to Noonday Collection in order to get to know you better. We are running a listener survey right now, and I just want you to tell us more about you. It seriously takes a couple of minutes. Like I said, you'll be entered to win a $100 Noonday Collection gift card to go on a shopping spree. So just head on over to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y backslash going scared survey, or click the link in the show notes. Again, you can visit bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y backslash going scared survey, or just click the link in the show notes. I can't wait to get to know you. I just want to create content that really serves you and meets you where you're at. So give me two minutes of your life. Hop on over. Take the survey. Thank you. Back to the show. So my daughter just turned 13. And it's funny because right after Tiffany's podcast, I was going to break down and buy her her first phone. But then after Tiffany, I was like, no, I'm sticking with the plan. She has to pay for her phone. She's got to. And so she did. She babysat. And she so she bought her first phone. She was the last kid at her school to not have an iPhone. Oh, my goodness. So it's it's been like three weeks now. And you wrote a book, I'm Judging You, The Do Better Manual, which is a collection of essays that critiques our fame-obsessed social media-centric lives. Now, I haven't let her get social yet, but I'm already seeing her disappear into her phone, and it's breaking my heart. But I'm curious, since you wrote that book that came out in 2000, 2016, which went straight to the New York Times bestseller list as it should have gone. What, how have we progressed or regressed since then? Because even in the last three years, social media and technology has changed. So like, what, 
you, you're, you have your head to the pulse of all of it. Yeah, I think we've regressed. There are certain things okay. that I wrote. <laughs> like, I do. Dang it. You know, when I wrote the book, I really was intentional about, I want to make sure this book is timely and timeless. Okay. As in, if somebody picks it up five, seven years after I wrote, I wrote it, they would still be like, yo, this is still relevant. However, I didn't want it to be so relevant that the things that I was talking about would actually be worsened. <laughs> like social media, <laughs> the fact that people now post pictures on LinkedIn that ah. has the, the, um, those filters, like the butterfly filters. Right. <laughs> I'm like, yo, this is a professional website. Why do you look like Tinkerbell in your headshot? What, if, what are we doing here? <laughs> like, I was like, yo, if I, wanna, if I wanna hire you to do marketing for my company, I don't want Tinkerbell. <laughs> No. Can can I see? Hey, what I mean you that's a like? good way to filter uh, potentials. It is. It is because I want you to be the person who's not just like posting Snapchat filters all day. But yeah, social media has man, it's gotten much harder. And to be a teenager during this time, and I think is one of the, probably the worst times ever to be a teenager because I'm thankful that we didn't have social media when we were growing up. Not none of us had cell phones at 13 because no. Uh -uh. And two, we did, I think we had like MySpace, but we didn't have MySpace till I was like 18 or 19. But what that right. allowed us to do was it allowed us to become the people that we would become yes. just based on our family and our friends and our schools. That's it. Now your world and your personhood is being dictated by people you might never meet, by this app that's in your hand, by watching other kids from around the world and you're comparing yourself to them. And it scares mm. me for the, this, this generation because it's tough. Ultimately, you're having to perform your childhood for approval. Mm. Like you essentially have your childhood ranked now. Oh my God, I posted a picture yesterday and it only got 30 likes. That can mess up a kid. Yeah. You know, yeah. mess up your you confidence. Mess up an adult. Girl, it messes up adults all the time. So let alone <laughs> a teenager who's still trying to form who they are. But I, I worry about them. I really do. I think I don't. And, and parents, shout out to y'all, how you're navigating it. Props, because whew, that's tough. Well, I have to say that absolute censorship or not letting her have a phone was so much easier than what we are dealing with now and it's mainly just a distraction and i've just i've asked her i'm trying to bring more reflection into my life and into her life and mm -hmm. so i'm like hey so it's been 3 weeks like what have been some good things about it and granted she gets to text her friends now so that's legit because come on friendships are essential in the 7th grade and mm -hmm. she's got such a great group of friends and she she had a flip phone before and so she couldn't like, I mean, it would take her like 20 minutes to write a text. <laughs> so girlfriend, I'm like, okay, I'm glad she's texting her friends. But then she just said, you know, mainly it's a distraction just because you just, you have stupid little, you just start scrolling and, but we have it, Levy. So we have it and we're worried about it, but it's not going away. So it's what not. are some of the ways that, what are the, some of the ways that you think about it? How do you kind of speak to your audience about it now? I really think... It's, it's more about who you are and understanding your core values and not letting the tool itself determine what your values are. And I, and I guess mm. that's why I worry about the younger kids is because you're not sure who you are yet. You know, you that's have to so figure true, out. Yeah. But ultimately, this thing can define who you are for you. So even for those of us who are older, who have been the bridge generation who remembers life before it, but are now immersed in it, we have to remind ourselves, who am I? What, what, what are the things that I hold dear? So because for me, honesty is something that I hold dear, I have to be honest with myself and the people who follow me. So I don't really like using um, deep, like those really bright filters. So I'm like, that's not what I look like. Like I'm not being honest mm. if I post that. So even using my own value of honesty keeps me honest too on the platform. Yeah. It means I'm not posting, you know, a picture of something I'm not doing just to impress people. It means I can say to my audience, hey, yeah, it's been a rough day, 
It means I can tell them, hey, yes, I went to therapy today. So ultimately, I want my platform to essentially reflect my values. So yeah, the stuff that I post is really authentic to me. Right. Um, and I think that's clutch. And it means it also means not falling into the um into the trap of posting like almost as competition, uh, right? Like don't do the things that are not real to you because you want to impress these people. Yeah. It's crazy how much thoughtfulness it takes. I wrote an article for the Magnolia Journal, Chip and Joanna Gaines um, have a magazine and it was, they asked me to write about authenticity and it's out right now, but just writing the article and having it out there has called me to this higher level of excellence mm-hmm. around filtering everything through that value of authenticity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you, I mean, your brand is about truth speaking. So it's almost like once you out yourself that, that like, this is my value, it almost holds you accountable to filtering everything that you put out there and making sure Sure. And of course, I'm, it's never 100% because sometimes my intentions are like, I'm having a hard day and give me some likes, you know? <laughs> not, right, I'm not right. beneath that. Right. But it never feels good in the end, you know? And it just can be this perpetual hamster wheel. But yeah, yeah. I think that's so true. Like knowing yeah. your values and then filtering everything through your values is what can actually bring life to the yeah. whole thing. And social media is honestly like, there are certain days where. I will log on to social and instantly feel stressed out just Mm. from because you get to see everybody's feelings and you get to see everybody's world. And usually they're highlight reels and the highlight reels and just and, you know, you also get to see the sharing of the news and you get to see sometimes if you venture into certain comment sections, the trash. So a lot of times you also have to be honest with yourself and be like, you know what, today this is not good for me. So I'm going to step back. Or, you know, maybe I need to go do something else. But it's honestly why I think we need to create the spaces that we want to see in the world and be the people we want to be around. Mm -hmm. That's really important is oftentimes we complain about what's happening in the world, but I'm always like, then what are we doing about it? How are we showing up to not be the people who stress other people out? And that's why I'm like, ultimately with Facebook and the Twitter and Instagram and Curate your spaces, you know, curate the spaces that you want to be in, that you want to see, pick the people you want to be around. If somebody's stressing you online, unfollow them. You know, like Mm. if, if there's somebody's social presence that does not feed you, unfollow them. Even if you know them in real life, you guys will still meet at brunch, but just be like, Hey, yeah, I just had to unfollow because for my own well being. Um, and for me, like I actually created my own network social network because I was being stressed out by the rest of social media. So I was like, mm. I'm out. I created a, um, my, my audience calls themselves love nation. And one thing that's always been great about my platforms, the one thing that I'm really proud of about my platforms is that half the battle, like half the joy is going on there and reading what I have to say. But the other half is what my audience has to say. They're so freaking funny. They're really, they really are. Funny. They oh my are. God. I was <laughs> They're so freaking funny. It just, it, it cracks me up. That's book material too. I mean, it you is. can just publish your comment feed. It is. So I decided, I was like, you know what? What if um, I create a platform where my audience just get to talk to each other, where essentially you get to have elevated conversation that does not have any trolls in it in a space. So I created um, lovenation.com to be my own social network and my, in this. Oh, 5, wow. 000. So yes. you have your own website. I do. I have my own like actual network where people get to talk and wow. you know it's just contains there's five thousand members and I launched it three weeks ago. So that is awesome. Yeah. I, I call it a safe space in a dumpster fire world because we need these spaces to co- go exhale and be like, you know what? Even if I'm gonna be challenged in here I won't be challenged hatefully. I won't be challenged yeah. by people who just want to throw me away. So yeah, it's we got to create the spaces we want to see. I wonder if that's going to start of a new trend, that you're going to start a new trend of people just saying, like, I'm out. Yeah, It's possible. It's, it's a, you know, I'm still on the major platforms, but I actually spend less time on there now because I, I go into Love Nation and yeah. it's encouraging in there. It's somebody literally said it feels like an exhale. Ah. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of how you opened the podcast just talking about home. Like it's where you're from and it's almost like you're, yes. you're creating a home for home. people. 
Absolutely. And home Absolutely. feels good. People want that. People want to come home. Yep. So I know you are an activist, and I know that you do want to be a verb in the world. And no big deal, Oprah Winfrey. Okay. Just, <laughs> you, I, I mean, I don't know if you can get through a podcast without me mentioning Oprah and Lovey. <laughs> So you were on her Super Soul 100 list as someone who elevates humanity. Hello. Now, please tell me your parents were proud of that one. Oh, my gosh. Very proud. (laughs) I mean, Oprah, honestly, that was surreal because when I got the email that was like, hey, congrats, you've been selected as one of Oprah's Super Soul 100. I deleted the email (laughs) because I thought it was spam. (laughs) <laughs> I was like, oh my God. I was like, nah, this ain't real. Yeah, I definitely deleted it. And then they sent me a follow up one. Then I was like, oh, snap. What? That's cool. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty awesome. So tell me about how you landed that list. Like, what are some things that you've been up to in the world where you've been a verb? Oh, man. You know, um, how I landed on the list, I'm not, I mean, I guess Oprah was checking out, of, checking me out. But um, over the years, I've, essentially built a platform for myself based around honesty and and I, I and I have this deep commitment to show up and make this world better than I found it in some way. I don't necessarily have to do anything huge every single day, but I've mm-hmm. also insisted on being authentically myself and mm-hmm. with the hope that it shows somebody else that they can also be themselves, whoever they are. So I've always done the things that I've compelled to do. I've always spoken up about the things I wanted to speak up about. So over the years, yeah, I end up ending on these grand stages because my writing, you know, in my writing is where I showed up the most, um, especially in the beginning. Uh, I would write about what's happening in the world. I would write about, you know, the injustice is happening, how black men and, and, and women and girls and boys were being shot in the streets. I would mm-hmm. write about all of this stuff. Um, and in the middle of it, I was making you laugh. So it started giving me more access and it started making my, my name more visible. And, um, yeah, I think just, it was a culmination of all of that. And I end up on Oprah's Super Soul 100 list with like Deepak Chopra and Ava DuVernay and Ariana Huffington. And it was nuts. I was just like, whoa. And Oprah did a brunch for us in LA. Yeah. So tell me about meeting her. Like, how do you actually feel in her presence? Is it how I imagine it? Yeah. So Oprah has this really calm, and for me anyway, she has this really calm in effect. Like I didn't feel the need to necessarily fangirl when I saw her. I was Uh just like, it's really nice to meet you because she has this really grounded spirit. Like she's very self-assured. You know how some people you meet them and you just feel jumpy just because they have this anxious energy. She has the opposite of yeah. that. Like feet solidly on the ground. She knows who she is. She's uh. not arrogant about it, but she absolutely knows her power and she owns it in a way that a lot of women are not encouraged to do. Mm. So I was, I loved it. Like it was very, yeah, it was soothing to my soul. I was like, oh my God, I'm meeting Oprah. And I just thought about how she was able to build everything she's built but still maintain herself. Yeah. So we talk a lot about social impact on this podcast, and I know you've done a lot of work around HIV AIDS. Tell us a little bit about that work and what, why is that the issue you really poured yourself into for the last decade or so? Yeah. Um, when I was in college, I was a counseling center paraprofessional, and I ended up having to do a project, um, a self-directed project. And I was like, well, I guess I'll research some something that's a chronic issue and and really highlight it. And I started researching, stumbled upon HIV and AIDS and realized how bad it was in terms of how it was affecting people around the globe and and realizing 40 million people have been uh, affected by HIV. So I started digging deeper into the topic, ended up doing this whole show while I was in college about Sub-Saharan Africa, um, HIV and AIDS and women and HIV and AIDS and, and, and Black people and how much it's really touched our communities. I ended up meeting somebody who became a friend of mine and she had 20 cousins who were living with her grandmother in Malawi um, because their parents had died of AIDS-related complications. And I was, I was shocked. It really put a story on the numbers I was seeing 
and it kind of gripped my heart. And I'm just like, this thing that nobody talks about it. How come? I was like, why did I just find out really about how bad it is? Because I went and did research, not because I heard about it around just the place. So I'm like, we got to start talking about it. So when I graduated from college, I ended up actually working for an HIV and AIDS nonprofit in Chicago. And I had the, and I realized that really no matter who's affected and living with the, with the virus and with the disease itself, um, women are usually affected the most because we're the mothers, we're the aunts, we're the wives and the sisters Mm -hmm. who have to take care of people. Um, And I realized if women could tackle the stigma, we wouldn't feel so alone. You know, we wouldn't feel so like we're villains for having, for for being a part of this larger epidemic. Um, So I started the Red Pump Project with my friend, Karen Watkins, using red shoes because we wanted to get people's attention in a way that was kind of sexy. You can't really ignore a pair of red shoes. So we started doing campaigns called Rock the Red Pump, where we would, every, every year, March 10th, we would ask women from all over the world to put on a pair of red shoes to talk about HIV and AIDS. Because if you can talk about it on Twitter, if you can talk about it on um, social media, if you can talk about it just actively in public, you can be able to talk about it to your partners, to your kids, and normalize the conversation about health and wellness. Because across the board, women's bodies are being policed. Um, We're always being put in shame for who we are Mm -hmm. and what we carry. And that then ends up having us sit in silence and suffering in silence, which then has this domino effect. So yeah, for for nine years, I ran the Red Pump Project. Um, It was a national nonprofit organization. We had chapters in five different cities and states. We did work with the U.S. um, Embassy in Haiti. It was an incredible journey. We just closed our doors in August. Um, yeah, because the work is not done, of course. This is still an issue that is high priority. But for me, I felt like my piece in running the organization was done. And mm. I still really think we still need to continue to talk about this epidemic. Yeah. What do you feel like are still the myths around HIV? Well, one, it's not an issue that is just affecting gay men. You know, women are actually being increasingly affected by HIV. Um, Every 47 minutes, a woman tests positive for it in the United States. So it's still, yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. It's up there. It's not fixed. People aren't getting cured of it. It is still an issue, still a chronic thing that we have to talk about. It's 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 getting slightly better because of um, health and, and technological advances. People are living right. decades with it. So it's so treatable now. I mean, I feel like so that's treatable. one of the myths that people yeah. don't know is that it's not a death sentence, it's that it's as treatable as type two diabetes. Yeah. And yeah, they've made such scientific advancements to where the medication, you can live with it, you know, really live like the, a normal lifespan as long as you take the appropriate, the appropriate medicine. But I think when people are stigmatized by HIV and don't even want to know they have it and don't necessarily know that they can <clears throat> live a long life, you know, then that's where it perpetuates the death toll, really, because yep. then people don't get treated. Yeah. A lot of people don't um, get treated or even tested until they're sick, which at that point means the virus has advanced and replicated itself so much in your body. That's when it becomes really hard to treat. When people find out early on, it's really manageable. But again, AIDS and HIV, not the flu, you know, ultimately we have the medicine, but prevention is better than treatment always. But and mm-hmm. that's one thing that we have to say, you know, empowering women, empowering all, each other to be safe when we're having sexual encounters and, you know, empowering women to be able to say, hey, I'm going to require this of you. Um, mm-hmm. And just knowing that we are worth protection and we're worth feeling safe in any encounter that we have. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for your work. I know it's uh, sometimes it's just as brave to start something as it is to, it, to step away from something and knowing that it's your time. So, um, but that that's legacy work that you've done. Okay. We like to wrap up 
by asking our guests how you are going scared right now. You know, I feel like I'm constantly going scared because I'm always challenging myself um, Mm -hmm. to do something new. So I don't feel like there's ever a time when I'm just like, oh, now I'm comfortable. I'm going to sit here. Anytime I'm like, okay, I've done this one thing. What's the next one? So I think um, my Nigerian next- parents there, that's Nigerian. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. They don't let you sit and smell the roses. Smell the roses though. It's good no. to smell the roses, but going scared is constantly doing new things and challenging myself. Right. So, so is mean, there something new on the horizon for you? Yes. Um, I'm actually launching the Do Better Academy. Uh, oh. Yeah. 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 The Do Better Academy is an online school that I'm creating. Um, to teach people business development and things to just make their professional lives better or get them closer to doing the thing that they want to do. So my first course in the Do Better Academy is um, a public speaking course. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I want to teach people how to be able to get on stages and get paid to show up and give people value and concrete takeaways on these talks because- I've been speaking for 10 years. I average 35 speaking engagements a year. And I feel like a lot of people don't know how to do this. So I want to Mm. teach them how to do it. So that's how I'm going scared. This is brand new for me. And uh, that's super exciting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to take that. I public speak, but I I need to learn. Like I need to, I need to learn. Be a learner there. Yeah, so I'm excited for that. I'm excited for that. I mentioned a couple of other podcasts during this episode. We have interviewed two other amazing Nigerian American women. So go on back and listen to Joe Saxton. That's episode number 19, where we talk about owning your voice as a leader. And then you can listen to Tiffany Aliche, episode number 49, The Budgetista, where we talk about money. I would like for my children to go be parented by all of these people's parents. That's that's all I'm saying. I have learned so much from my Nigerian American sisters. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show. Before we go, don't forget to head on over to your podcast app and give Going Scared a rating or a review if you have not done that already. I love this community of Going Scared listeners. I love hearing your thoughts. Who are some guests you would like to hear from? What are some things you want to hear? Drop me a DM on Instagram and let me know. We are planning right now our next series that will launch in August. Our wonderful music for today's show is by my good friend, Ellie Holcomb. Going Scared is produced by Eddie Kolfholtz, and I'm Jessica Honiger. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared.